Uh, right, so it's great to be here. Thank you very much, Bart, for the um, introduction. And wonderful to be in Romania. It's my first visit to Romania, um, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Um, so a bit embarrassed by my title. I put 44 years of um, uh, medical into computing, and I think that's far too long, and it's, um, I, I, I should have retired years ago, shouldn't I? Uh, um, but I interpreted, so Bart said in an email, um, I think to all of us, um, that he wanted a little bit of background about how we got where we are and how we set up the groups um, that we did and what the story of that. So I'm going to spend about five, ten minutes on just a little bit of that history and then I'm going to be talking about the um, uh, work that I've been doing just in the last um, uh, a few years in the... Um, uh, that we have a centre for surgical and interventional sciences, where I'm coming in as the imaging person, though I was directing it for, um, uh, for a while, um, but how we're then really pushing um, that technology through um, into changing healthcare. Um, because, as I think I'll say this again, or I'll try and remember to say it, um, um, and I think it was um, Wiro who said this, we go along to our conferences, our Mikai conferences and so on, and we publish all wonderful new methods and they get very well reviewed, they finish up in the leading journals. Um, but less than 10% of those um, ideas will ever make it into uh, changing uh, patient healthcare. Um, yet, there's some very good ideas there and we need to find ways of doing that better. So I'm gonna say a little bit about that. Um, but um, uh, back to me, um, so um, things started for me um, in medical imaging back in 1975 um, and when I finished my masters, um, I finished up working in this rather tatty old building here um, where they were doing some uh, nuclear medicine, um, uh, so you know, I think you all know what nuclear medicine is, um, and they wanted a basic grade physicist to sort of help um, run the show. Um, in the three years that I was there, um, that building got transformed to a nice new building. Um, we were all very pleased with that, and we introduced quite a lot of new technology. And I was the person who played around with something called um, an intertechnique um, multi eight computer, which was a, um, it had a ferrite core, eight kilobytes of ferrite core, and it had to be hand um, booted up. Um, on a set of switches at the front of the computer every day. Um, and then the only way of getting data in and out was by paper tape. And things have moved on uh, quite a lot since then. But I learned a couple of things um, um, in my three years there. Um, one was that if I wanted to become a real scientist, um, I had to get a PhD, um, so I decided to do a PhD. Um, but I guess my main lesson is that it is really hard trying to make life um, work as a professional musician. So I stopped being a professional musician and I went on to do my PhD. Um, so I went to the University of Surrey, which is in Guildford, south of London, um, and I worked on a joint project with the Institute of Cancer Research. Um, and I was um, uh, supervised with this formidable lady up on the top left there, Daphne Jackson, um, who was a real pioneer of um, her work in this area and a wonderful lady to work for. She also um, was, well, she was the first um, female professor, full professor of physics in the UK, which is quite remarkable. That's 1978 uh, that we, uh, before we had our first uh, um, uh, female professor of physics. And she always promoted uh, women in science and engineering and set up a number of charities in the UK to uh, uh, promote that. And she kept me under control. Um, um, and we had lots of arguments about what I was going to do for my PhD, um, but it was a wonderful time. Most importantly, I was um, working on the first whole body CT scanner that had ever been produced. Uh, actually, two were produced. One went to Manchester and one went to London. Um, and so I was working with the um, uh, team at EMI. And uh, one great thing about CT scanners in those days um, is that when they finished scanning at about 5 o'clock, I could get my toolkit out and I took it to bits. And I played with it. I played with the detectors. I took everything apart um, in order to do my PhD and put it back together again at about three o'clock in the morning. I was working nights. Um, um, and usually it worked the next morning, except for one time I remember being called at, um, at 8 a.m. because the CT scanner wasn't working. In fact, it turned out it wasn't my fault, though the finger of blame was pointed at me. Um, so I finished my PhD there in dual energy CT, and a lesson on that was I produced some new algorithms um, which didn't find their way into clinical practice, 
because the technology that was then available just wasn't able uh, to deliver the data that I wanted. Um, and in fact, it took another 40 years uh, before the CT scanners uh, that we now have have dual energy incorporated in them. And so it was quite reassuring to see that some of those old papers I published circa 1980 um, have now been cited quite a lot in the last three or four years um, uh, showing um, how to do um, the analysis of tissue composition. Um, I then uh, moved um, back into um, healthcare, um, and I think this was actually quite an important time for me because I uh, was working close to patients. I was in a clinical department. Um, I was seeing the patients coming into the nuclear medicine department, which I set up there at St. George's Hospital. Um, and I realized how badly we were treating patients, um, um, that we weren't able uh, to make any real difference in a whole tranche of uh, diseases. And I had this strong feeling at the time that although I'm not a medic and I'm not medically trained, there is an engineering or a computational solution which might be applied to improve at least our understanding of the disease and hopefully the way that we would um, um, help to uh, uh, treat. Um, and I worked with, um, uh, for this guy, John Perry, and it was really back to the CT theme because John Perry uh, was the first author of the third of the three papers that were published in 1971 uh, when CT scanning was first introduced. So Godfrey Hounsfield was the inventor, he got the Nobel Prize. Um, uh, Jamie Ambrose was a neuroradiologist at Atkinson Morley Hospital, which is part of St. George's Hospital, and John Perry was the physicist, and he did some of the quality control, image quality assessment, and the, um, in particular the radiation dosimetry uh, for that first CT scanner. Um, so I worked there for seven years, thoroughly enjoyed myself, but I then found that although I was starting to do a bit of research and trying to change a bit of how things happened, it, I couldn't do it from within a clinical science job uh, within the NHS, that if I wanted to change things, um, I had to be operating in a different environment. And so I decided to go back to academia um, and got an academic position at this place, Guy's Hospital. Um, Guy's Hospital doesn't look like that anymore because now uh, we've got this enormous building called the Shard, which is right in, in front of Guy's Hospital, so you can't actually see uh, Guy's Hospital from that side anymore. And I set about doing what I was novel to me at that time, um, but of course has been the treadmill all along. If you want to do some work, you need to raise money, getting grants, um, recruiting students, and so on and so forth. And so built up a modest team, and by the time uh, we were doing the work on combining information from different imaging modalities, I'll just show these, let's see, get those started, yeah. Um, no, nope, that managed to stop it, I think, didn't it? There we go. Um, that um, by combining information from different modalities, we could get a bit of extra information. Um, to do that, we need to do image registration. And so with myself, Colin Studholm, and Derek Hill, some of you may know Derek Hill, um, uh, we came up with some interesting new algorithms which automated that process. And I think that was part of the, again, a theme that went through. If you're really going to make an impact, you've got to make things automatic. And I think that's where some of the neural network and deep learning stuff so is, is so good now because it is automating the process. So you don't need to have too much um, um, interaction. And we show that with just this small example. They're able to do that. Um, so um, founded what was then called the Computational in Imaging Science Group. It was the precursor of CMIC. Um, and um, in 1997, when the key papers were published on the image registration work, um, I'll just show, this sh shows uh, very quickly an iteration to um, um, uh, maximize uh, mutual information, um, which was a very powerful algorithm that we uh, discovered around about that time. Um, you were able to get good alignment, but of course it took hours to run on the computers at that time, so it wasn't really practical. Um, but we were 10 people, so we were quite a small group. Um, um, but these papers became highly cited. It put our lab on the map. Uh, we got involved with conferences like ITME, um, uh, the precursors of the MICI conferences. Um, and in a way, the sort of rest was history uh, because we built up... Oh, yes, yeah, so this important piece of work that was done by um, uh, Daniel Rukert when he was in our lab, uh, which was extending the um, uh, rigid body registration to the non-rigid paradigm, um, and that had quite a significant impact. Um, and I think it was at that time, too, um, that job that I got at Guy's Hospital 
um, would only have been was only made possible because Siemens uh, put some money into the uh, post. Uh, so we're being creative about creating a new post. Uh, so my first job was half funded by Siemens. Um, and um, um, so I had a lot of interaction uh, with um, Siemens in Erlangen um, at that time um, in the various projects I was involved with. Um, later, um, um, I was working with Philips as well and got to know what was going on in their research labs, in particular in Eindhoven. Um, and uh, I saw how important it was to have this triangle. I first created this triangle, which I've been using this in slides for many, many years now. Um, so we have us, academic medical imaging groups, um, working on algorithms and new ideas and so on. Um, uh, we have the medical engineering industry, uh, which might be Philips, Siemens, or whoever, um, or might now be startups. There's a, a vibrant community of new startups. And then we have the healthcare providers, uh, uh, which is the hospitals or clinics, or sometimes the uh, primary um, healthcare. Uh, and we have to have all parts of that triangle working to enable us to have that clinical translation. So going forward again, um, 2005, um, for a variety of reasons, we decided to move to UCL. They just opened a brand new shiny hospital at uh, University College Hospital. Um, and um, so that was one of the reasons for moving there. And there were some other opportunities that came up. By that time, we were 30 people. So still, I think, by modern standards, quite a modest sized lab. Um, and I formed CMIC uh, by joining together. That's the Center for Medical Image Computing. Uh, by joining together with some uh, like-minded people in computer science and medical physics at um, UCL. And back to our triangle. Um, this is now coming up to the um, um, present day. Still the same triangle. Um, here we have the Center for Medical Image Computing. That's now um, firmly embedded in the uh, UCL AI Center, so really getting uh, deep connections with all the latest that's going on in the sort of deep learning stuff. And then um, a couple of years ago, uh, we got the, um, um, some funding to set up a uh, center for surgical and interventional sciences. And this is an interesting one. I'm going to be spending now um, quite a lot of time talking about that um, to where we have a center which has got computer scientists, um, biomedical engineers, mechanical engineers, physicists, mathematicians, but also it's got radiologists, it's got um, trainee surgeons, it's got urologists and cardiologists. Um, and so they're all embedded within the same center. So it's a truly multidisciplinary setup. Um, and that's um, great fun. Um, oh yes, and what we're doing in this center is tackling some of these other things, uh, compliance with the regulatory environment and so on, to really enable us to push uh, technology through into healthcare. So this is the WISE Center. Um, so um, it was actually formed by um, um, Seb Ursulin, who was the uh, PI at the time. Um, but it built on about 20 years of activity of a number of uh, co-Is in seeing how we could use this computational and biomedical engineering technology to improve the way we did sur surgery and intervention. So that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my uh, uh, of this talk. Um, as I say, strongly multidisciplinary. We've got a lovely brand new refurbished building right bang in the center of London. Um, it's back at what used to be the old uh, Middlesex Hospital. Um, it's not exactly where the hospital is. It's not embedded in the hospital. It's about a 10 minutes walk away. Um, but it is where the, cer the academic surgeons and interventionists are all based. Um, um, so they quite like escaping from the hospital and coming to this. We've got their labs and their offices are all um, there. Um, so it's a great environment for uh, brainstorming uh, new ideas and for getting the uh, uh, work done. Um, so um, actually, I want to just a quick aside. Uh, it's actually called Charles Bell's House. And if you Google Charles Bell, um, he was a surgeon um, between 1774 and 1842, quite a cantankerous person who didn't get on with anybody, um, um, but he was an effective surgeon. Um, and as a hobby, he used to um, uh, take uh, dead people's brains and uh, bodies and dissect them. It was quite a hobby in those days uh, that you would take them and then you'd do um, um, uh, wax copies of, the, uh, of what you saw. Um, and he was quite an accomplished artist. Um, 
Um, his discovery, which makes him famous, is he separated uh, the sensory from the motor uh, nervous system. Um, so it's different nerve fibers we use for making our hands move to what we use for feeling things. Um, and uh, Bull, um, Bell's palsy, um, which some of you may have heard of, um, is named after him. Um, but anyway, so we're, we're, everything in London is always steeped in history. Um, so here's our centre. Um, we have 18 engineering faculty um, who are um, part of the centre, 23 clinical faculty, so actually outnumbered slightly by the doctors, um, 15 clinical training fellows, 31 engineers, and 13 non-clinical students. Um, and this was at our review almost exactly a year ago, I got those figures, and I think we've gone up by about 30% since then. So it gives you some idea of the scale of the activity. Um, and this is the diagram. I mean, some of you, a lot of you have probably seen this diagram. This is the um, depth of despair, it's sometimes called, or the valley of death. You've got a new idea, a new innovation in medical technology. You go through these various different stages. You finish up, hopefully, with a preclinical evaluation, which may be on an animal experiment or on um, uh, cells in a, a Petri dish. Um, and then you fail to make it into the human trial. Uh, so what we're trying to do is get across that translational gap and get stuff into um, a clinic. The interesting thing about that, and that's been my motivation all along, from when I spent all that time working as a clinical scientist through to uh, where I am now, that actually when you start tackling that, you find out what the real question that needs to be solved, needs to be answered is. Um, and that gets you back into some basic um, uh, science and ba basic computational work. Um, so I don't agree with the idea that because we're so applied, we're not going to be doing any of the basic work. It's the being applied, we understand what the questions are, which enables us to tackle some of the fundamental issues and then work back with the computer scientists. And I think this is true now, um, even more so with the um, advent of the enormous advances we're seeing in deep learning. Um, um, and then we go through to uh, something which is much more commercially orientated, where raising funds, uh, getting startups, um, getting our product, um, uh, well, first of all, identifying a product, something that can be sold. Um, it might be a service, it might be a gizmo or whatever and getting that out there and changing um, healthcare. So we cover it within the center pretty well the whole range of um, interventions that take place in the body, not quite, uh, but we have uh, gastrointestinal, pediatrics, fetal, uh, musculoskeletal, uh, the central nervous system, neurosurgery and so on, uh, hepatobiliary, cardiovascular system and neurology. Um, and I'm just gonna pick out two examples, one in um, uh, urology um, and one in uh, hepatobiliary, uh, just to demonstrate how we work. Um, is it working? Can you hear me? <laughs> Do I need to hold it closer to my mouth? I will try to. <laughs> Tell me at the back if you can't. Alex, can you hear me? <laughs> right. He can when I shout. Tell me if, I, if my voice drops and I will speak clearer and louder. Right. Um, so alongside that, we have some technology platforms. Now, this is an arbitrary cut mainly because of the interests of the uh, PIs on the engineering side, and it's not well thought through or really defined as the right way to do it, but it's just what we have. Um, so uh, we have uh, technologists working in optical ultrasound, all optical ultrasound, that's using um, uh, fiber optics uh, as both um, uh, uh, transmitters and detectors of um, ultrasound. Uh, we have surgical navigation work and all the tracking technologies and so on we have. Um, we have endoscopic vision, so that's when we put cameras up through the uh, colon or down the esophagus or in other parts of the body, and we get video back and how we can interpret that video. A lot of AI comes into that. Um, Photoacoustic imaging, um, nano-engineered coatings. This, and that might seem it's a bit different from all the imaging stuff, but really transformative in terms if you couple that together with some of the other technology, uh, we can solve or potentially solve some of the big issues that surgeons have at the moment of, say, reuse of um, instruments um, to ensure that they're not infected by bacteria, for example, by um, antibiotic-resistant um, bacteria. And so that is, um, looks like it might have a major impact. Um, um, ultrasound technologies, uh, robots, um, and then very similar to what um, 
uh, um, Alex was talking about is a simulation platform to allow us to simulate, pr well, pretty well anything, and that's going to expand, I'm sure. Right, so the history that went into this, um, and this is going back 20 years or more than 20 years, 25 years, 26 years, um, to the early work that we did, this was actually with Philips, um, where we were involved in the development of something called the Easy Guide system, um, showing how we could track a pointer uh, within the patient and locate that within that patient's CT or MRI scan. And this just shows uh, quite a remarkable uh, procedure that was not possible without that navigation. Fairly gory picture here. This is going through from the mouth uh, to um, uh, clip an aneurysm in the vertebral artery. Um, so that would probably be done by coiling these days. Um, but this shows the corresponding, um <coughs> I think, um, uh, CT scan. Uh, no, MRI scan, sorry. Uh, coming down here, and there's the aneurysm, and there's the vertebral artery. And he had to come around just one side there and then clip. He could not see what he was doing. He had to do that by uh, navigation. Um, and that's back in 1993. A few years later, uh, we did some uh, visualization work in the stereo operating microscope, um, which enables us, after tracking where the patient's head is in, um, and the surgical instruments are, uh, we can find, superimpose an MRI image of here a, um, um, an acoustic neuroma um, uh, to ensure that the whole acoustic neuroma is excised at um, um, surgery. And that accuracy, the accuracy on there was about one millimeter, um, uh, which was sufficient for what we needed. But now up to the present day, um, this is the first example, um, image-guided liver surgery or image-guided laparoscopic surgery. So we'd felt for many years that we could apply this navigation technology to um, other parts of the body. And so we've been working with um, Brian Davison, who's the professor of liver surgery at the Royal Free Hospital for several years, now, or many years now, um, to see whether we can improve um, the patient experience from having um, a liver resection. So um, liver resection, well, let's, let's start with bowel cancer. Bowel cancer um, is one of the major cancers. Um, Many patients will die from it. Those patients who die from it usually die from metastasis that have spread to the liver. For a proportion of those, you can save their lives by removing, having removed the original primary, you then remove the uh, um, uh, metastatic deposit within the liver. Um, doing that liver surgery is difficult. Um, uh, we're talking about patients who are older. Their liver um, function may not be quite as good. They may have been drinking too much, for example. And so we've got to be very careful about the, uh, about the surgery. Um, at the moment, the surgery is done as an open procedure. And I've got to know quite well um, one of um, Brian Davison's patients who had an open surgical procedure. Um, so he was um, cut from about here down to about here, so a very, very long cut. And it took him a long, long time to recover from that procedure. Um, the procedure appears to have saved his life. He's still with us about 15, 20 years after the procedure. Um, but it completely changed his life. He um, had to give up work. He um, was a keen sportsman. He couldn't play sports afterwards. And yet, if you go to a laparoscopic um, mineral invasive treatment, um, then the patient is up and about and able to do most um, activity um, a week or two um, after their procedure. Um, um, so there is significant, and there's also significant cost savings um, um, if we can do that. Um, so at the moment, only about 10% of cases in the UK are done laparoscopically with improved guidance. Um, by giving the surgeon better field of view, perhaps we can increase that up to 30 or 40% and make some patients who are currently not um, eligible for liver surgery eligible um, and therefore save their lives. Um, so the technologies that we've been looking at, um, so uh, the patient is insufflated, a telescope is placed into the abdomen, um, uh, what we call a laparoscope. Um, the laparoscopes we're using now are stereo laparoscopes. Um, and so that enables the surgeon to see what they're doing. And then they have another hole in the abdomen uh, where an instrument goes in and they can cut. And this also can be done with a da Vinci robot, which operates in a similar way, but the, uh, the devices are manipulated remotely. Um, so the first thing we looked at was at the, um, uh, the endoscope. Um, and with that endoscope, if it's stereo, uh, we can do some fast reconstruction and build up a series of um, 3D um, 
surfaces of the liver and use that to do a registration. And I'll actually skip through, actually I'll just say, I'll skip that slide, um, just talk um, through the system that we've put together. So we have a tracking system, camera system here, which is tracking these infrared reflecting um, spheres that are placed on the end of an endoscope. Um, we know where the endoscope is, we can compute where the tip is within the patient, we're reconstructing the surface, so we're now reconstructing a 3D model of the liver surface in the operating room, and we can match that back to the preoperative um, image that we acquired on CT. Um, so um, this shows in a bit more detail. This is the surgical view, uh, here's a surgical instrument, that's the liver. Um, here is the preoperative CT that's been segmented into different structures, and we're going to register um, that surface onto the surface of the liver to enable us to locate critical structures um, which you can't, the surgeon can't see, that's in particular the vascular structures um, of the liver, to enable the cutting to take place without cutting major blood vessels. Um, and we've gone through um, all the stages of... Um, getting that into the clinic. Um, so we started off with animal work. Uh, we used a porcine mo model, a pig model. Um, we then transferred that into a patient trial running alongside the patient, and we're posed now to have a prospective trial where we're going to try this on patients uh, prospectively. And so this is the sort of display that we provide. So here is the out, um, um, outline of the liver, um, and here is the vascular structures underneath, and these are the 3D models that the surgeon is manipulating um, um, in the operating room um, to enable that guidance to take place. So, okay, fair and, what, fair and good. I don't think this is ever going to be fully um, clinically implemented or commercialized because it's too much of a flaff and too complicated to use. Um, and it's, um, there's too much extra technology like the tracking system. Um, and it's just there's a number of impediments to it being used. So what we've done recently is look back at that whole patient workflow and how can we use um, a number of technologies to, uh, to improve it. And the first technology is a deep learning based um, um, uh, um, um, algorithm uh, to help us in the interpretation of those endoscopic um, images. So this is a um, work done by Maria Robu, who's just about to submit her PhD um, and um, the relevant papers. So this is actually unpublished work at the moment. So I can't go into too much detail about, about how it's done, but to show you the main results. So if the hypothesis or the um, reasoning behind her uh, PhD project was that if we could identify precisely where the liver is automatically within that surgical field of view, then we could use features from that to register directly to the model and throw away the tracker. We don't need to have a tracker anymore. Um, we would significantly simplify the system. What's more, if we can do that with a, um, a deep learning paradigm, we can take months and months and months to train the system, but having trained the system, we can get the answer of where the liver is in the laparoscopic view in a fraction of a second. So in effect, we have a real-time system. And she has pretty well um, proven that. So here's a series of training images that she used. Here is a series of manual um, drawings um, that surgeons have done of where the liver is. And see, there's quite different, those views up the top there. And there's two features that they're collecting from there. The liver is a round, domed-like structure, and it's got an edge. The front edge is visible in most of the images, and this is painted in blue. Um, so that's quite a good feature. The other is a silhouette. You've got this rounded structure, and you've got the top of that dome, um, and that's shown in yellow. So this is the training set. Then having done with a relatively limited training set, she actually got her algorithm to reproduce those pretty well. But then the innovation that she did is said, well, how can we make the training better? So she produced um, a very, very large number of synthetic um, um, uh, laparoscopic views uh, with the help of some other work that's going on in the project. And that was many tens of thousands of those views. Um, and now she has produced a pretty robust um, 
uh, way of determining that. And if we can then incorporate that back into our system, and we haven't done that bit yet, then it makes it much more practical. Hello. Sorry, I didn't hear. Oh, right. So there are different types of feature. Um, this is... So I, I wish I had a model of the liver. The, the liver has quite a sharp edge at the front because uh, it's a narrow structure. Um, so that's well defined in the space of the liver where that is. The other is determined by the endoscopic view. Um, so it's a silhouette of where the top of the liver is. So it may, depending on the precise pose of the liver in relation to the endoscope, may be in a slightly different position. But it's a very important feature and you can use it, still use it for registration because you know it's the silhouette, it's the boundary of the silhouette of the uh, liver. Um, well, it was a combination of modeling and taking real data. So they, she had some, um, uh, for, for those patients for, who, for whom she had a um, um, laparoscopic view, she also had the CT model. Um, and so she was be able to combine the two and then generate a very large number of synthetic views, which were realistic. Um, and we do, we've done some validation on that. Um, and it appeared to, um, uh, it, it increased the, improved the performance of the um, uh, procedure quite significantly. <laughs> I think you are right. <laughs> uh, right, yeah, I should have said that. My apologies to Maria. Um, so, um, uh, and the other piece of work by Zhao, who is Portuguese, um, um, <laughs> is uh, we have a, f a truly international lab. And uh, don't get me on to Brexit, by the way. I'll discuss that at lunchtime. We're, 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 we are going to remain a, a truly international lab, and we're looking forward to uh, remaining so in the future. Um, right, where was I? I? Completely distracted. Yes, so now the other feature, we are looking at blood vessels, um, or we want to display to the surgeon the blood vessels because the blood vessels are important because the surgeon needs to know where they are so they don't accidentally cut them. And they often do accidentally cut them. They are, they're always accidentally cutting small ones and have to go in and cauterize. And every now and again, they might cut a large one. If they cut a large one with a laparoscopic procedure, um, that's the main reason why they then have to revert to open surgery. So they pull out all the instruments and they very quickly open up the patient, um, open everything up and find where the blood vessel up so they can clamp it off. And it's a fairly, um, I've seen a video of it happening. I've fortunately never been in the operating room when that has happened. It's traumatic and it is dangerous. The patient usually survives or very rarely doesn't um, um, but it's boy does it put the blood pressure of the surgeon and everybody else in the operating room up when that happens and you want to try and avoid that right so blood vessels show up on ultrasound um, and there's something called laparoscopic ultrasound so Zhao here has also um, just in the process of submitting his PhD and has got a couple of papers out on this already and this is a very clever way of using that data Traditionally, you would track where the ultrasound probe was by having one of those trackers on the end of the ultrasound probe, and that's almost impractical to use in the um, um, surgical space. So he said, and this he came up, came up with this idea, I've observed how the surgeon just moves the probe slowly over the liver and gets a sequence of images, and there's strong correlation between not one image and the next image, and the probe doesn't move very quickly. So he said, right, let's use that information to see whether we can constrain the registration of that ultrasound data to the um, uh, preoperative CT scan. So here is the ultrasound data um, from one uh, patient, image 3, 7, and 10 in a sequence. Here is it segmented to show these black things are the blood vessels. And after doing a registration, going through the CT data, here from the same view, here are the corresponding blobs according to the blood vessels intersected on the CT. And he used um, something called content-based retrieval um, to see how, given a lot of those synthetic um, scans through the CT data, he could track where the ultrasound probe had moved. And after a lot of of effort, and it's going to be um, presented at the uh, MICI work workshop, SUSI, Susie, um, in a couple of weeks' time, um, he was able to show how that worked. And that, I think, is a game changer, because we can incorporate laparoscopic ultrasound and the video now 
without having tracking technology. So there's no extra technology in the operating room except for taking video feeds of the ultrasound and the um, video um, and doing some uh, processing on it. So no other sort of fancy hardware. So it's going to make the translation so much easier to do. So it's watch this space. We haven't done that translation, but that's the next stage we're going to go to. So how am I doing for time? I've got one, I've got, so I can talk about, okay. So that's an incomplete story, but we can now really, I think only as of the last couple of months, can see the light at the end of the tunnel, how we can produce a system that can now go through regulatory approval, get a proper clinical trial, um, and hopefully turned into some sort of product, um, either by licensing to a large company or doing it our own, um, to enable that to go in and change how uh, liver surgery is done. Here's another example. This one is further down the translational pipeline, but there's still development going on. Uh, prostate cancer. Um, so it was mentioned, I think, was it Vero mentioned uh, prostate cancer briefly? Um, so it's, a, um, it's the commonest cancer in, the, in Europe, uh, Western Europe, uh, for men. Um, it only affects men. Uh, breast cancer only, well, largely only affects women. Um, last year in the UK, um, the death rate from prostate cancer overtook the death rate from breast cancer for the first time. So the death rate is going up, probably because we're all growing older um, and we're not dying of cardiovascular disease. Um, though there may be an underlying increase, which is a bit of a mystery. What is happening is we're getting much, much better at detecting it. So I think these are the right figures. 160,000 men in the UK last year were um, detected at having prostate cancer. Only 40,000 of those were um, uh, died. Um, and um, that means there is massive over, um, over diagnosis. You've probably heard of overdiagnosis. It's, a, it's relevant in breast cancer as well and some of the other cancers. Um, Overdiagnosis, you're going to save their life, you're going to detect, detect the cancer early, but you are going to impose because the surgical intervention to uh, remove the prostate has major side effects. You're going to impose a major change in quality of life on a large number of men, and probably 80, 90% of those men didn't have to have that procedure. Um, and that really is quite a, I think, a phenomenal statistic and a... Um, pretty damning um, observation of um, modern medicine. Um, in it's the same in North America, it's the same in Europe. Um, we need to do something about that. So, um, inspired by Mark Emberton, um, who was the uh, lead urologist when I arrived at UCL, uh, we um, set up a project to see what the contribution could be on the biomedical engineering to that. So, the big thing that's been changing in the last five or six years is the introduction of MRI as an earlier stage in the um, diagnosis and, and um, staging of uh, prostate cancer. This is what uh, one of the MRI sequences looks like of the prostate. They're not very easy images to interpret. Um, that large arrow there is to help me say there's a cancer there. Uh, I would not have detected that um, uh, without um, having that arrow to help me. Um, but we've introduced now what's called multi-parametric MRI. I think the phrase was used earlier on. Multi-parametric MRI um, is an anatomical image, T2. It is a diffusion, sorry, a, a diffusion-weighted image sequence from which the ADC, um, apparent diffusion coefficient, is computed. And it is a dynamic contrast-enhanced sequence after the injection of a gadolinium um, containing um, a chelate is, is injected. Those three images are put together. There's a whole story about improving the way that we process those images, and uh, machine learning, deep learning is coming in big time on that to um, uh, make that better, but I'm not going to be talking about that now, except to say, with multi-parametric MRI, we have a dramatic change in the patient um, journey uh, through the healthcare system. So if they have high PSA, prostate-specific antigen, that's a blood-borne marker of something wrong with the prostate. It's very, it's pretty sensitive, but not terribly specific to prostate cancer. So it goes up for lots of other reasons than just prostate cancer. We have um, symptoms, um, you know, difficulty in peeing and things like that. Um, and there might be family history as well. If those are there, 
then you go for a multi-parametric MRI, then you have a problem because you show a, a region that might be a lesion and you've got to sample it. So where we were coming in was saying, having got a signal, a focal lesion on MRI, can we now place the needle more accurately in the prostate in order to take a tissue sample to confirm the disease. Um, so that's what Dean Barrett in our lab and, um, and his team uh, set about doing. So this is what the ultrasound looks like. Uh, so it's um, fairly unpleasant showing here. Transrectal ultrasound, so it's an uh, ultrasound place there, taking a picture of the um, uh, prostate. Um, and we need to align this with this so that this mechanism here can fire the biopsy needle into the appropriate place of the, bi of the prostate to take the um, tissue sample. Um, and so the work that was developed, and this started back in, well, shortly after we moved to um, UCH, uh, UCL, so about 2007, um, and the uh, Yipeng Hu, who was a PhD student at the time, um, devised the algorithm, which I'll describe in just a sec. Uh, we patented that and then have turned that into a product called Smart Target, and it's got FDA approval and CE marking and has now been marketed. Um, so the way it works, we have delineation, um, automatic delineation of the ultrasound. Um, we have previously delineated the MRI, and this is shown schematically on here. Um, so this little cartoon shows how the, we're taking the MRI-derived volume and trying to map it onto a series of um, ultrasound slices. Um, and we get, I mean, one of the things, I want you to remember this, uh, we're getting a target registration error of about two millimeters, which is good enough to target the lesions. The lesions we're looking at, um, a lesion is, is considered to be insignificant if it's less than five millimeters. And so with a two millimeter TRE, uh, we are very likely to get it. Um, so this is how the algorithm works that um, Yipeng um, devised. It's a non-rigid problem. We see here how much the um, prostate is being distorted by the presence of the ultrasound probe. Also, the patient is in a different position on the, um, uh, having the ultrasound done than they are lying in the scanner. Uh, they've got their legs up in the air. Um, and so we need to have a non-rigid paradigm. And there's not a lot of cues here to drive uh, a Daniel Rukert type B-spline registration algorithm. Um, so we need to do something else. And this is where the uh, biomechanical modeling came in. So having got our MR volume, we then synthesize a large number of different deformations of that prostate with a range of probes that we have learned, uh, sorry, a range of positions of the ultrasound probe that we have learned. We may do about 100 of those simulations. We do principal component analysis of the deformation vectors, and we take the most significant three or four of those principal components, and then we use that as the constraint of the non-rigid registration between MRI and ultrasound. And it works. Um, one modification that we did, um, or uh, Yipeng did, a year or two after the first algorithm was produced, uh, is as follows. So there is all happening as a patient-specific um, statistical motion model. Um, but then what he observed, having done um, of the order of 100 patients, that when he was looking at the um, principal components of the deformation fields from that population of 100, they were very, very close to the individual uh, ones. So they didn't vary very much. Um, and so he was able to now um, uh, have what he called a generative uh, statistical motion model and to use what has learned before to apply to a new one coming in, which um, sped up the uh, problem quite significantly and enabled us to... Um, he, he finished up with pretty well the same uh, target registration error. Um, and that is what's in the um, product at the moment. Um, so we've done a clinical trial. So this is what I want to emphasize about the things you have to do to make something so it makes an impact and gets into um, healthcare. We had to do a, a clinical trial. So we set up um, a clinical trial of the uh, Smart Target system. Um, this built on the back of a significant trial that was published um, two years ago in Lancet. This is the one that showed that multi-parametric MRI um, um, significantly improved the accuracy of the biopsy for cancer. So if you did the multi-parametric MRI 
um, before you did the biopsy, you were much more likely to pick up the cancer than if you didn't. It's kind of obvious. Um, rather than randomly stick needles into something about that big, um, if you've got a target in that, um, in that um, structure, uh, you're more likely to hit it. Um, um, but it still needs a clinical trial to prove that. And that's what was published then. And that had a big impact worldwide in how prostate cancer is managed because most men will now have an MRI before they had their biopsy. <coughs> um, so from this group of patients, we had 129 men who had a discrete lesion on multiparametric MRI that were going to have targeted biopsy. And then we did, um, we had two strategies. One was where our system was used. <coughs> and one where it wasn't used, and it was just used, the urology skill was used to target, given the MRI image. And actually, what we showed, that they were identical. Neither were perfect. Um, 93, there were 93 clinically significant prostate cancers in those 129 men. So you see, MRI does still come up with something like uh, 40 um, lesions which aren't cancer, uh, but 93 were. 80 of those were picked up by our machine um, used for guidance, 80 by the urologist. It was a different 80. So between them, they got all 93. And we were sort of poured over those results for quite a long time. And that's one of the things you have to think through and work very closely with your clinical colleagues. What does that mean? Um, so the machine was picking up, our automated machine was picking up cancers that the skilled urologist couldn't and vice versa. But the vast majority were picked up by both. So the conclusion from the paper, which has just been published, um, is that our system is as good as a skilled urologist. What we haven't proven is that our system is better than a urologist who is not used to doing this all the time. Though the um, inference is that, that that is probably true. But it was sufficient for us to get this through to um, uh, get um, 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 the relevant regulatory clearance. And just to finish off that story, um, there's one more um, um, sort of stage. You know, this has just happened recently. And again, this is going to be uh, presented at Mekai in a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, Yipeng, having done all that work with the biomechanical modeling and so on, he's got a lot of data. It's about 500, I think, patients um, where we've now got the registered MR and ultrasound and we've got the pre-registered. Um, and he said, well, can we just do all that as a learning exercise rather than go through all this thing about... Uh, biome careful biomechanical modeling? And the answer is you can. Um, and so uh, by changing the registration problem to what he calls conditional segmentation, um, he can take the region of interest that's on the, um, the moving image here is the MRI, this is the ultrasound, the fixed image. Um, um, having done lots and lots and lots of um, mapping the MRI uh, region of interest onto the ultrasound, he can now take a new, a completely new data set with a new region of interest and map that accurately onto the ultrasound. And he comes up with pretty well the same, about two, 2.1 uh, millimeters TRE. Um, so we actually then don't do the need to do that computation. Whether it actually, we've already done that training with the biomechanical model, um, whether we'll stick with that or with the machine learn one, I don't know. But it's interesting to know that the two are equivalent. Um, and certainly means that we can run the, um, the algorithm runs much, much faster than it, um, than it did before. So it runs in a, in a fraction of a second. Right. So, um, yeah. Uh, and uh, this is just a slide from Epeng's paper showing that compared with the registration networks he published last year, he's getting down to the... Um, uh, the target registration error um, of the uh, current system. Uh, okay, so I've got one more small bit and then I finish. Is that okay? When's lunch? Am I eating into lunch, <laughs> as they say? I've got one more speaker, so... Uh, this... Maybe... Yeah, yeah. Uh, because what I was going to do, I've talked a lot about the engineering process and um, uh, how we then get that into a project and some of the things that we have to do to turn it into a regulatory approved um, device and how we're picking up um, um, some machine learning. But I just thought it was um, worth going back into some of the biophysics just briefly. And it's the same story. It's the cancer story. And it's something that's sort of quite close to my heart. And it's looking at 
what happens at the cellular level um, in the imaging that we get. And I think there's a learning paradigm in this as well, um, which um, I think there's a big opportunity for all you folk, people back in London, to, uh, to look at. And that is understanding a little bit better um, what we mean by, um, by cancer and how we diagnose cancer. The cancer is diagnosed by taking a sample of tissue and taking a slice of that tissue, staining it and looking at it on a slide at a resolution of a fraction of a micron. Um, and we look at cells, the groupings of cells, and we look at uh, nuclei structure and so on and so forth. And that the currently that gives us the definitive diagnosis. And MRI is just a means to that end, uh, or imaging is only a means to decide who is going to have that um, uh, histology. So. I was thinking for a while, um, and have been thinking, and so have others, of is there information in the medical image that enables us to predict what the histology is? So we're now three orders of magnitude away in terms of spatial resolution, but can we predict histology grade given the MRI if we've got enough information? So th that's where the training comes in, so I think we will be able to do that by machine learning, but I'm, I'm just going to go through a biophysics um, approach to that now. If you look at the medical imaging contrast, we have cellular scale information from proton diffusion, acoustic impedance in ultrasound. Um, we have molecular scale information in proton relaxation times, biomechanical, biochemical processes in PET and SPECT. Um, X-ray gets right down to um, um, atomic scale. Um, but the one I'll be talking about now is the proton diffusion length. The proton diffusion length where just by playing around with the MRI sequence, we have a ruler um, that is measuring um, phenomena that are taking place at micron scale, or a few tens of micron scale. And that's a fantastic tool to use, and diffusion-weighted imaging has become very powerful. If you go back to our, can our prostate cancer, um, just to be a, a very simple lesson in histology, uh, we have the three components, the lumen, um, the uh, prostate is a, uh, a fluid secreting organ um, and therefore it's made up of a, a tree-like structure with, um, with tubes, with a lumen. Um, we have epithelium, uh, which is the boundary of those tubes um, shown around here. Um, and then we have the stroma, which holds everything together. Um, if we look at um, benign disease or a normal prostate, it's mainly stroma, the connective tissue, um, and a little bit of epithelial tissue. If you look at cancer, it's the epithelial tissue um, that goes out of control and starts multiplying and becomes much larger. Um, and so there is a big change from the, of that ratio of epithelial to uh, stromal tissue. Um, it's more complicated than that, but that's very crudely um, wha what happens. And that's shown there. So we have some tools in MRI. Um, so we can model the MRI signal by intracellular water trapped within cells, extracellular non-vascular water, and water in blood, um, uh, so and the uh, diffusion of, uh, of protons in the, in the water in blood. And we can build up models. I won't go, there's a lot of maths in that, and I haven't got time to go into that, except to say there's a number of parameters that we can derive. Uh, we can derive um, the um, uh, proportion of, in, uh, of intracellular fluid, the uh, proportion of extra um, extracellular fluid, and so on. And if we produce maps of that, um, oh, sorry, one thing we have to do, if we're going to do this, we need to line up the MRI image with the histology very, very accurately. So we've been working with Roger Bourne in, uh, down in Australia um, to um, adapt a system that he um, uh, um, invented over there, uh, where we have the patient in the MRI, uh, we have the... Um, prostate, this is for pro patients who do have prostatectomy, so the prostate's taken out. It's put into a 3D mold that's printed from the MRI, so it's a patient-specific 3D mold, the prostate, because prostates are different sizes and shape from one individual to the next. Um, that MRI, so, so that uh, prostate in a mold is then scanned at very high field, um, and that produces that image there. This is the clinical image. These are registered. We then cut the, the uh, prostate up, and that gives these images, and those are stained to give us the histology image. Um, and so that gives us a pathway to go back from the histology data 
uh, back to the MRI. And then with that, we can do a proper validation of the um, work that we've been doing. And this is the result. And it's um, uh, just been published in radiology. And it's, um, I think, very exciting. Um, still need to do more work. For men with prostate, there's this um, really um, important distinction between what we call a Gleason grade 3 and a Gleason grade 4 um, lesion. And it's really difficult to detect that on MRI. Um, and this side, the patient has to be treated. This side, current thought is the patient goes on to active surveillance and we don't do anything unless something changes in the cancer. I'm being told to wind up. <laughs> um, so anyway, what we did on that study, um, I can't remember how many patients it was now, yeah, 86 men, um, is we got a clear distinction between 3 plus 3 and 3 plus 4. So we're able to predict the histology pretty accurately on those men. And that is now going into clinical practice. Right, so I'm just going to finish off now. This is it. Um, so I had to put this slide up. So uh, I'm not a deep learning person. And rather like Wiro in telling his story, I can remember back in the 90s, I, I think I was judging a PhD uh, of somebody who'd done a neural net PhD. And it was so inconclusive. And the, the results, he'd worked so hard at it. He got his PhD. Um, but I was really put off that technology. Um, but of course, we were all proved wrong, weren't we, uh, when, the, when that, uh, uh, the, the, those papers came out. Um, and it really has changed the way we're doing. And so if you look at what's happening now in our center, Almost everything involves deep learning in some form or another. And we're seeing in the surgical interventional space, um, there's sort of front-end stuff, which is improving diagnosis and so on, and whether people are going to have surgery. But actually in the surgical intervention itself, we're seeing how this technology is making it much easier to translate because it's um, we're automating certain processes uh, which make gets rid of some technology like the uh, tracker and makes everything uh, much faster and much easier to use. So we are in the middle of a revolution. And then my final slide, which I think I'm probably going to concentrate more on uh, tomorrow, um, but the other thing that's changed in the last um, uh, 20 years is I think our the attitude in academia to working with industry and becoming entrepreneurs ourselves. Um, and so I've been fortunate to be involved in quite a large number of small startups uh, that have come out of our lab or have been associated with our lab. Um, so these, these companies have all gone through and been very successfully financially, and they go back quite a few years. These three companies, uh, that's a, that's a um, surgical endoscopy, um, sorry, colonoscopy, automated colonoscopy interpretation system. Um, this is a... Um, uh, the all optical ultrasound for um, as a cardiovascular probe um, and this is the smart target I was talking about with the prostate so they're being incubated within our lab at the moment so we're incubating companies within our building which I think is quite exciting and then these are uh, uh, two examples of companies that are um, functioning they are successful um, um, started up by um, um, ex PhD students of mine though I, th I now have no, nothing to do with them um, um, and then what we have created within UCL and most other um, universities are doing the same is the right sort of environment to encourage that entrepreneurial activity to happen we have something wonderful called the, the hatchery startup incubators directed primarily to undergraduate um, students. Um, if they come up with a good idea, um, that is where they can go, they can get some space, they can get a somewhere where they can sort of grow the ideas um, without having to sort of raise the money and so on. And, and they also have contact with other successful entrepreneurs in a um, very exciting space. It's, um, it's called um, uh, what's it, uh, um, Base uh, King's Cross, KX Base King's Cross. Um, and it's, um, it's a great place to visit and, and, and see how it works. So that's me done. Um, so I have to acknowledge everybody, because I've been talking about everybody else's work, all the Weiss co eyes, but in particular those individuals, um, the clinicians I've been working with, um, our funding agencies, um, government, uh, EU, and um, uh, charity, um, but also all the companies that we've worked very closely with. Thank you very much.